Welcome to our 17th annual Sunday Salons. And I'm um, Betsy Jacks. I'm executive director of the Thomas Cole National Historic Site. Thank you all for coming today. We have with us a truly wonderful scholar, um, Elizabeth Hutchinson. She's the associate professor of art history at um, Barnard and Columbia University. And for those of you art historian buffs in the room, she occupies the position once occupied by Barbara Novak. And um, <laughs> see, that means something in this crowd. <laughs> She, in addition to her teaching duties, she also is on the executive committee of Barnard's American Studies Program and Columbia's Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race. She earned her BA at Yale and her PhD at Stanford University. And her courses examine American visual culture from the colonial period through the 20th century, so a really broad swath. Um, in addition to that, she's developed specialized, native cl specialized classes on Native American art, the Harlem Renaissance, and the Hudson River School. And um, at lunch just now, she was telling us how she has the freedom at Barnard to do really creative things. And so she led a summer institute where she brought high school teachers on a boat on the Hudson River to teach them about American culture So and took them out sketching. And so it really just sounds like a program that we'd all like to sign up for. Um, anyway, we're thrilled to have her come today and talk about a topic that we're very eager to learn more about, the Native American figures in Thomas Cole's paintings. So please welcome Elizabeth Hutchinson. Thank you for that introduction and the invitation to be here with all of you. Um, it's a real pleasure to come back to Maple Grove. It's been a I mean, Cedar Grove, it's been a very long time since I've been here. Um, I want to start before I speak by acknowledging that we're on the um, territory of the Kayankahaka people, the Mohawk people of this land, and in a territory that's been crossed and used by many indigenous peoples um, across the centuries, um, and recognize indigenous peoples of this land, past, present, and future. Um, and... Um, I'm starting with a juxtaposition of a photograph of where we are and a recent piece of Mohawk um, raised beadwork um, showing some of the plants of this land. And I just thought I'd also start for, um, uh, what I'm gonna be doing today is not only talking about native figures, but also talking about land as native. So I wanted to start um, with just a tiny bit of the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving address. Haudenosaunee is the name that Iroquois uh, people call themselves. Um, so today we have gathered and we see the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. We are all thankful to our mother, the earth, for she gives us all that we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk upon her. She gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning of time. To our mother, we send greetings and thanks. In this Thanksgiving address, which is given daily by many Haudenosaunee people and at the beginning of all important gatherings, stanzas of this address continue to greet the natural world. In turn, we have stanzas that thank the waters, the fish, and importantly, two stanzas that thank plants, actually three. One general acknowledging the vast fields of plant life, uh, working many wonders and sustaining life of many kinds, and then one on plants as the source of and then finally one on plants as the source of medicine. I'm interested in this notion of really turning in 360 degrees and looking at the land around us as something that indigenous people did on the sites that, that we are finding ourselves today and on the sites that Thomas Cole um, painted. Because what I wanna think through are the ways in which indigeneity and the indigeneity of this land does and doesn't figure in his work and put it in conversation with the ways in which notions of um, Haudenosaunee land are figured in work by native artists, past and present. If we look at Thomas Cole's paintings, we see actually that in many ways he figures indigenous people not in the, not 
uh, rooted in the land, but rather um, moving through it as transient beings. So I'm juxtaposing here his wonderful painting of Catterskill Falls, uh, so close to this location, a site probably a lot of you know, um, where there is this teeny tiny little native figure perched here um, at the edge of the falls carrying uh, a bow and arrow and somewhere over here in the woods is the deer that he is pursuing. He is in the mountains, he is on foot, he is alone. Um, and then we see in Cole uh, a notion of dwelling in this landscape that is ascribed to Anglo-Americans, right? To what we call settlers. I'm gonna refer to European Americans as settlers um, using the concept of settler colonialism that is an essential way of understanding um, how nation states emerged here in North America and elsewhere, in which um, it's white people, it's, it's settlers who carve out a permanent dwelling in this landscape, who clear the land, who build houses on it, um, who turn the land into something productive by, uh, by starting farms. Um, Again and again, if we look at the native figures in Cole's work, we see indigenous people not by the riverside, not in houses, not in farms, but um, at the very precipices of the edges of the wilderness that Cole loved so much, right? Right at the edges, high in the mountains on rock cliffs. So here are many, um, three of his pieces from Last of the Mohicans, and then in the lower right, something called Indian sacrifice. If we look at these paintings too, we might notice that even when the, they depict multiple Native Americans, they are mostly young adult men, so we don't get the sense of indigenous culture as family-oriented, intergenerational, or of the occupation of this land as having that kind of settled permanence that we get when we look at things like, um, like home in the wilderness. Now, I was asked here to help Maybe some people think through Cole's depiction of Native American figures, but I am instead going to be looking at some paintings today that don't show Native American figures and dig up some ways in which they might help us think through a Native history on this land um, and think through the absence of Native figures in these pictures as well as the presence of Native figures in the paintings that I just showed you. And I wanna think in particular about um, Cole's trip to the estate of um, uh, the Fanshawe estate in Schoharie County, where he spent the winter of 1826, and he made five paintings, three of, um, of uh, George William Fanshawe's home and a couple of the surrounding area. So I'm gonna be looking at paintings like this one. Um, this is a view on the Schoharie. It shows um, the rather new town of uh, L'Esperance um, in the background, uh, but this is an area not too far from where we're standing here. Um, and this is a area just, uh, as I said, in um, Schoharie County, south uh, of the Mohawk River, west of us here. And if we look both at the paintings of the river itself or paintings of the Fanshawe estate near Duanesburg from 1826, um, this is uh, the land that I want to think through in particular in ways that are related to native land. Um, George William Fanshawe was a geologist, British born like Cole, uh, who worked for New York State and the federal government. In fact, he uh, surveyed part of the Louisiana Purchase. He was also a speculator, so he uh, bought land in this part of New York, developed it uh, for his own agricultural pursuits, including raising these merino crossbred sheep that you can see here in this painting. And he was one of the proposers of the Albany and Schenectady Railroad, which itself was one of the very first railroads in North America. It ran sort of just along the lines of the Erie Canal south of the Mohawk River. And of course, it facilitated the transportation of people and goods in and out of the region where he owned property. He was... Um, occupying land at that time that had been of interest to settlers for quite a long time. So um, it's, um, I'm showing you a couple of maps here. Sorry, getting out my watch so that I don't ramble on and on too much. Um, this area is historically part of Mohawk territory, um, which you can see in a map of the six nations of the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee from the early 18th century. Most of New York State um, was occupied by these um, 
six allied tribes. They had been allied for hundreds of years before the settlers arrived, the Tuscarora being a group that had been dislocated um, from their Delaware homelands down south and relocated and been welcomed. And as you can see, these, um, these territories are kind of allied in a row with one another. But um, in this map here by Guy Johnson, the nephew of the um, Superintendent of Indian Affairs for the British colonial government, made in 1771, um, after a treaty negotiating new boundaries with uh, the British government in 1767, you can see that this is still an area associated with native people. The Mohawk are here in the east, and uh, you probably can't see that detail there, but um, it basically says that much of this land continues to be shared between Mohawk people and Anglo settlers. I have a detail which will help us see a little bit more closely what we're looking at here. So, um, L'Esperance is here on the Schoharie. Duanesburg, which uh, the Fanshawe Estate is quite close to, is just a little bit east of that. And at the time of the making of this map, and indeed through the revolution, um, these two areas are incredibly close to two very large Mohawk villages, Count of Johari here and um, Fort Hunter or Tyononderoge, not Ticonderoga, but Tyononderoge, uh, right here at the confluence of the Mohawk and the Schoharie Rivers. There's also an important uh, Mohawk village down here in the southern part of the Susquehanna, um, and a lot of uh, settlement and transportation of Mohawk people through this valley here, which is exactly the valley that Fanshawe and his father-in-law, uh, James Duane, the eponymous uh, founder of Duanesburg, are seeking to settle in the early 19th century, are developing um, an increasing presence. Now, this area, as I said, had been mutually occupied until the uh, negotiations of this, um, of this 1867 treaty. And it had been really occupied through important diplomatic exchanges and interactions between the indigenous people and the Dutch settlers. Interactions that were governed in the Haudenosaunee mind by a treaty understood as the two row, and I'm showing you a wampum belt here on the bottom called the two row wampum uh, that traces back to 1613. Um, I'll tell you in a second what the other wampum belt is too, but the two row wampum was basically a negotiation in 1613 where the Dutch and the Haudenosaunee decided that they would establish what was called a covenant chain of friendship, an ongoing, durable, intergenerational relationship in which they each agreed to govern their own affairs and not interfere with the affairs of the other. The two rows that we see here on this wampum belt, which is a visual covenant modification, much like a written document, um, of that negotiation itself, a permanent thing that would last intergenerationally, just like a document and just like the covenant was supposed to last, um, symbolizes two canoes going down the river next to one another, not crossing each other's path, not cutting the other off. So the two rows are, um, are, are two cultures um, and occupying the land together in a non-interfering way. And in fact, there was a two-row renewal campaign in 2013 that some of you may have witnessed because uh, there was quite a large um, group of uh, Haudenosaunee people bringing the wampum belt down the Hudson River. And many people believe that the canoes were, uh, were moving through the Hudson. So, uh, and just the, the top row is actually uh, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy wampum belt, and it signifies the agreement between the original five tribes of the Iroquois to work with one another in a powerful alliance with the council fire being uh, right at the center. Um, so the Mohawk are the keepers of the eastern door, and these are arrayed kind of geographically. And this is the central council fire, and it also looks a lot like a tree. and um, it is said to resemble the white pine tree that the peacemaker, the negotiator of this agreement between these five peoples, pointed to as a metaphor for the kind of relationship that they were to have. So he said the white pine tree um, has roots that move in all four directions, and it holds together um, all of the um, space and living beings around it um, and reaches up towards the sky world and down into 
the earth. Um, and this is how our relationships should be with one another as we seek to understand our mutual dependency and always keep peace as our priority in uh, recognizing the roles that we all have to play. So here we are back in Fanshawe's land and we can see a wood chopper and you know we think of coal as someone who um, is very much against the chopping down of trees, right? The ravages of the ax, he's concerned, he's an environmentalist. And so we might think about the way in which when he's painting Fanshawe's estate, he is perhaps with some bittersweetness recognizing the human um, efforts to carve out a place for themselves against the wilderness and, um, and see this as part of the kind of burgeoning of white settlement in this area that um, is necessary but, but that he believes you know, should be undertaken with a kind of measured pace. But the story that I want to tell about this land is actually a little different than one of, uh, of white settlement eking out a place in a pre previously existing wilderness. And the first, first step in thinking through that is to suggest that the land that we're looking at was not initially settled by European Americans, but that this area close to the Mohawk and Hudson River confluence was actually quite full of Mohawk farms at the time of the making of that map that we just looked at, at the time of the negotiation of the 18, uh, 1767 Fort Stanwix Treaty and certainly at the time of the American Revolution. In fact, this area was so fecund and fertile and supportive of strong native life that it became a target during the American Revolution of uh, Union, of, of, of rebel troops. Um, so you may know that the uh, Iroquois primarily allied with the British in the American Revolution. The Oneida and Tuscarora took the side of the patriots, as we call them, um, but the other four tribal nations took the side of the British, with whom they had had long-standing relationships that inherited the kind of covenant chain on diplomatic relationships that had been negotiated with the Dutch in the early 17th century. And so uh, not only were they allied, but the Iroquois were powerful military leaders. Under the leadership of Joseph Brandt, who's from not too far from here, they conducted raids on American troops that were just devastating. And as a result, in 1779, George Washington ordered Captain John Sullivan to lead a campaign through upstate New York to basically destroy native culture here. This is a map of the Sullivan campaign. Sullivan is actually coming up from Easton, Pennsylvania, up the Susquehanna through what is now Delaware territory. But James Clinton, I don't know if he's a relative of the governor, George Clinton, who uh, followed the revolution, but James Clinton led troops down through this area, starting in Kanajahari and coming down um, into uh, the southern Susquehanna. And along the way, they burned homes, they plowed under fields, they devastated the soil, uh, tried to poison the livelihood that this landscape could provide for its um, for the people who occupied it. And in so doing, of course, they not only put to flight indigenous families and settlements, um, destroying indigenous villages, but they also laid the groundwork for white settlement to come in in the early 19th century, people like James Duane and William Fanshawe to move into this land. And you can see that I'm interested in. Well, I can tell you more about that Treaty of Fort Stanwix in 1867, but I don't want to use all of my time to tell you history. But I do want to say that James Duane was already somebody very interested in promoting something like this kind of campaign. He was in the colonial government um, 
prior to the revolution, and he was part of the Continental Congress. He is Fanshawe's father-in-law, and as I said, the owner of territory in uh, of land in Dwaynesburg. He's an early speculator in private land holdings in the um, Skohari region, and he was under the Continental Congress, actually, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, and one of the things that he advocated as a Indian agent for that government was to cease diplomatic negotiations with Native Americans and instead simply declare Native land to be the property of the American colonies. After the revolution, he made similar kinds of appeals to the state government of New York. Um, most of the land of upstate New York was rather um, in vague holding after the Revolutionary War, because it had been understood to be the sovereign territory of Haudenosaunee peoples, but because of their alliance with the British, they had been forced off the land. And for the decade of 1790, it was unclear whether that land would be claimed by New York, by Massachusetts, or by the federal government. All of them desperately wanted that land because they had soldiers who had not been paid to fight, and they had promised those soldiers some kind of compensation. And so the ability to pay those soldiers in land was going to be able to pay their salaries. So there was a, a, a real rivalry over this land, and, um, and Duane was one of the advocates that it become part of New York. And in fact, New York um, somewhat illegally claimed some of the land in this region before that idea got firmly settled. And as you can see from this map by Alan Taylor, the marvelous historian of this period and this region, um, the area that we're talking about was quite rapidly settled already within just a couple of years of the end of the American Revolution. So um, there was already some Euro-American presence close to the watershed, and then the next areas to get settled are right along the rivers. And of course, they're right along the rivers for a couple of reasons. They're easy to get to. Um, easy to navigate through, but also these rivers supply low agricultural land with the water that's needed and produce um, a sense of, of um, rich fertility that was very much desired by the people who wanted to develop farms in upstate New York. And the area that I'm talking about um, right around here was close enough to the Hudson and close enough to New York City and eventually close enough to the Erie Canal and the railroad that Fanshawe was involved in to be particularly desirable to the... So that is enough of a reason, perhaps, to think about um, settler desire for the land that we're on. But in fact, there's more to it than that. Because uh, this land doesn't only have rivers, but because of the geological history of this region, this is some of the, was some of the most highly productive agricultural land in the Northeast. And it was land that um, was already demonstrated by the time of the Sullivan campaign as being incredibly productive. And for just a second here, I wanna look a little bit at this painting and think a little bit about the ways in which it demonstrates the potential productivity of this land. And I'm particularly interested not so much in these sheep who are brought in and are grazing um, this land, but in this area here where we can see a mixture of local plants. I think these are largely not um, introduced species and um, if I had more time and was a better botanist, and maybe some of the pollination folks will talk about this further, um, you could look close here and you could see perhaps little shots of burdock, little shots of, um, of some of the medicinal and food plants that are thanked in the Haudenosaunee Address of Thanksgiving. When I look at this area, I see these tall stalks. They make me think perhaps of goldenrod in the wintertime, or even perhaps um, some remnant of corn being grown in this area, particularly because right at the base of these stalks, I see these broad, flat leaves. Now, broad, flat leaves, if we're looking at uh, local plants, we might think of skunk cabbage, but we might also think about squash which has very large leaves in the fall and winter. Coal is at Fanshawe's estate over the winter months. Um, and um, the proximity of something that could be corn and could be squash makes me think of the Native American agricultural tradition of the Three Sisters. So one of the things that that is an essential aspect of Native agriculture was the 
discovery of the value of planting certain kinds of plants together, making an agricultural mound of dirt and putting in it together the seeds of corn, beans, and squash. This agricultural innovation was profound because not only were these plants complementary in what they took out of and gave back to the soil, allowing the same land to be uh, farmed year after year without having to um, have years of fallow, but they also physically supported one another. So the tall stalks of corn also provided a support for the climbing vines of beans that could allow the fruits to get access to the sun without harming the, um, the flowering corn at the top, uh, which was also getting the sun and producing corn cobs. Now this was, as I said, an agricultural tradition that had been richly developed in this area. And in fact, when we, um, hello, when we look at the records from um, the time of the colonial period, um, from all of the military struggles over this land, we find incredible records of the fecundity of this area. Um, the uh, Haudenosaunee bio, um, I mean, uh, ethnobotanist Jane Mount Pleasant, uh, she's a Tuscarora woman who works at Cornell, has studied the primary documents and found um, really interesting quotes. In 1687, the report of the Marquise de Denonville, uh, French governor of New France, who was engaged in a punitive campaign in central Iroquois, wrote about um, all of the rich, full fields of corn and vegetables that he saw and bragged of destroying more than 1.2 million bushels of corn on this campaign, campaign uh, corn, beans, and vegetables that he found both in fields and in very full storehouses. George Washington is often um, uh, called in by Haudenosaunee people uh, Konotakarius, or town destroyer. And this is uh, just an example from a work of art by Alan Michelson, a Mohawk artist, about George Washington. He's been doing a lot of thinking through George Washington lately, including in a piece at the Whitney that was up over the winter that perhaps you got a chance to see. People who were involved in Sullivan's campaign left behind records of the incredible amount of uh, agricultural products that they found in the towns that they were passing through, that they were plowing under, cutting down, and setting on fire. Um, for example, John Burroughs on August 27, 1779, um, suggested the surprise and awe that he felt when he saw Iroquois maize fields. Quote, we got this night at a large flat three miles distance from Chemung, where corn grows such as not can be equaled in Jersey. The field contains about 100 acres, beans, cucumbers, watermelons, and pumpkin in such quantities were represented in a manner it should be, would be almost incredible to a civilized people. Similarly, Lieutenant Samuel Shute reported, the army was employed in destroying corn, which was not less than 200 acres intermixed with beans and the best I ever saw. Corn is an absolutely essential component of native occupation of this land and associated with the origin story of the Haudenosaunee people who tell a story of sky woman falling from a world above this one into this world, gripping the seeds for these plants in her hand and giving them to the people of this area of Turtle Island, of the, of, of the um, earthly dwelling as a gift for them to be able to sustain them. Connecting her community's persistence across generations from a period of Sky Mother's time, we have to be able to work together to continue growing corn. It is something other people have neither the knowledge of or the responsibility for. As I reach 40, she was 40 when she wrote this, she's a little older now, I have to be able to know how to grow this. It is as simple as that. Understanding when to plant, the moon, the seasons, knowing how to feel it, look at it, touch it, working side by side with the people who know. We want to keep the seeds going because they will feed our people for the next seven generations. The corn literally feeds us. At the same time, we can center ourselves around it to feed us on the spiritual and cultural level. Mount Pleasant has produced this map 
which shows the most agriculturally productive soils in present day New York State. And I think it's pretty easy to see how the Sullivan campaign um, expropriated this incredibly productive territory from native people. The collaborators with the British were relocated from New York across the border into Canada, leaving their lands available for um, settler development. And I think when we keep this idea in mind, um, it allows us to think through Cole's notion of a home in the wilderness. So this is another Alan Michelson piece. He's actually made a, um, a little log cabin that perfectly um, reproduces the scale and the um, shape and sizes of the uh, cabin in Cole's home in the wilderness, but he has used um, the map from the Fort Stanwix Treaty um, to wrap the, the pieces that make this log cabin. Um, and this is important to me because the same records of the rich cornfields that we find from people on the Sullivan campaign also talk about villages full of homes made out of, um, of logs, um, towns that have centers, towns that have community gathering spaces, multiple generations living in them. And indeed, because of the covenant chain and the longstanding 200 years of intergenerational exchange between the native peoples of this land and the white settlers, people who were literate, people who had books in these homes and beds and contemporary clothing and were engaged in a wide array of contemporary habits and practices um, identical to those of their settler neighbors, even as they continued to celebrate corn festivals and worship um, by saying the Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee prayer of thanksgiving, and in other ways continue their culture as their culture changed over time. It wasn't just cornfields, but also homes like this one that were burned down and reproduced with cabins for the settlers. And this is um, important and interesting, I think, because it makes us think again about things like this painting, about Cole's suggestion that no one was here dwelling in this land in a permanent ongoing agricultural way, and maybe even of those uh, James Fenimore Cooper novels, which suggest uh, the location of native culture is on the run, alone, men in the woods, and not um, these kinds of settlements which are ascribed for, um, for the arrival of what's perceived of as new ways of dwelling in the land. In other words, without ascribing any intentional hatred or genocidal impulse on the part of these individuals, they participated in a culture of willful erasure of a prior uh, civilization so that they could tell stories of a new discovery and a new development of um, understanding uh, understanding this land and executing it um, in a particular way. And um, I think we can think through then the ravages of the acts a little bit differently. One of the things that Mount Pleasant's research has demonstrated is uh, early historians suggested that Indigenous agriculture was often very temporary and short-lived, that occasionally they engaged in burning down uh, forests to create small gardens and clearings, but that in fact, in this rich, fertile land of upstate New York, woods were rather permanently cleared by these rather permanent indigenous settlements. And in fact, at the Fanshawe State, one of the things that Thomas Cole complains about is that the land is so flat and empty. My dear colleague, William Coleman, published an article, a curator at Olana, published an article recently where he looked at Cole's letters and, um, and his records of staying there, and Cole was saying, what an unspectacular landscape. I'm so bored painting this flat uh, alluvial plain with these trees with big holes between them. And, and, and Coleman even went to the woods and he said, yeah, you know, the, the trees continue to be kind of sparse. This, this land continues to be kind of empty. But in fact, what we might be seeing, and you know, this is speculative, but we might be seeing land that was cleared for hundreds of years because it's right there by the water on the floodplain where there's enough um, uh, richness in the, in the soil to grow crops. And, um, and, and as Mount Pleasant says, uh, this land was cleared permanently and was farmed intergenerationally. And, um, and she even goes so far as to say that the productivity of the land um, was what it was without tillage. Once the settlers came in, they actually yielded a lot less 
from their tillage, and she blames things like livestock, um, who are introducing things into the soil. She blames the introduced species, um, the weeds, which took things out of the soil and destroyed its productivity. And she actually blames plowing. Plowing um, in churning things up brought those seeds of the invasive species, the weeds, further into the soil and also um, leached out some of its natural goodness. So the yield actually went down after settlement, even though um, plowing was perceived to be the more civilized way of dealing with this landscape. So this landscape may include some echoes of this earlier agricultural occupation. To end, I wanted to talk just a little bit about, um, about native art production that has been in relationship to this land for the same amount of time as native agricultural occupation of this land. I was just up at the house and I was listening to the introduction, um, uh, the beautiful, wonderful introduction that Thomas Cole introduces himself to us in his own words. And he says, this land's never been um, represented before I got here. And of course, that's just not true. The Mohawk people understand themselves to be of this land, and so their art is full of representations of this land. In fact, um, the, the Mohawk word for these people, um, Kanyan Kahaka, uh, means people of the chert, which is, of course, a kind of geological um, feature very present in the local landscape, and we can see it in Cole's, um, in Cole's paintings. But um, if we look at indigenous material culture, we see a representation both of the features of the landscape, like the plants that nurture the people intergenerationally, and also of a worldview that suggests that the people who occupy this land are of this land and have a mutual custodial relationship with it. In other words, um, one in which they are grateful for the land for taking care of them, but also understand that they must needs take care of the land if it's gonna continue to be able to play that role. And one way in which this can be understood, um, and this is uh, an argument advanced by Jolene Rickard um, in an exhibition catalog essay for the um, traveling exhibition a couple of years ago, Picturing the Americas, we might look at the work of this seamstress and clan mother, Caroline Parker, or um, also known as Gahano. She's a leader of the Seneca community, and as a clan mother, one of the people who inherited the wisdom from Sky Woman as it was passed down, an important part of Iroquois political organization, and one that also was frequently left out of history books as um, diplomatic negotiations with men frequently only recorded the male participants. But she was particularly well known for her beadwork, and this is a, a skirt um, that she chose to be photographed in, an entire ensemble that she made herself. And um, Rickard reads this representation here on the border of the skirt ideologically. And let me just show you a detail of it. So this is a cosmographic representation of the world in which we see the dome of the sky, perhaps reminding us of how um, the space from which Sky Woman fell in creation story, but also reminding us of the mounds in which the three sisters were planted and the appearance of three seeds under the earth there and then the sprouting up above might also be understood as a reference to this agriculture, knowledge that was held by women and passed down by women, and here is being worn by a woman who's committed to passing down not only practical information, but also the, the more conceptual and spiritual dimension of the information, which is to say, planting corn is not just a technology. As Rickard says, it's a means of being part of a culture. And this is persisting through this day. So this is a, a work of art by a, a Mohawk artist named Carla Hemlock. It's in an exhibition that's traveling around the country right now called Hearts of, of Our People about Native women's work. And this is a, a piece that she beaded and felted entirely herself. And she writes of the um, beaded placket that goes down the two sides of this outfit. This outfit itself very much looking like the kinds of clothing that she saw in old photographs of uh, Iroquois people from the 19th century. She says, um, the women of the past, present, and future who are linked together that will continue to walk in each other's footsteps. Another really meaningful 
piece of contemporary Haudenosaunee work represents that white pine that the peacemaker pointed to as a metaphorical connection between um, the different people allied together and working together in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. In this piece, too, we see many of the ways in which this white pine is an entire world. We see strawberries hanging from the trees. We see the flowers of the woodlands forest at the base. So the foods and medicines that sustain the community, the wisdom coming um, from Sky Woman. And in the story, the historical story of the great tree of peace, an eagle lands at the top of the tree. Eagles are important in Haudenosaunee creation story, not only because they are powerful predators um, and part of the landscape, but also because they mediate the terrestrial world and the sky world, so important figures. By way of ending, I want to I want to look at a really recent piece by Jolene here, and I'm putting it in conversation um, with Asher Duran's quite famous Kindred Spirits. Um, these birds that turn up in Iroquois are both figurative and real. Jolene reminds us in this piece, which is an homage to the extinction of the passenger pigeon, once the most abundant bird in North America, um, and uh, a bird who literally littered the forests of the Northeast and was a profound source of food for indigenous people and subsequently in the 19th century for settlers. And in fact, the reason it went extinct was it was um, hunted uh, to extinction because of, uh, of people hunting it primarily for food, but it just blew blanketed this region, um, reminding us that these woods that we love to walk through were once just cacophonous with birdsong um, and, and full of the motion that these birds uh, provided. And she has created um, uh, this, this juxtaposition between uh, Haudenosaunee beadwork birds associated with, um, with creation story and then um, specimens from natural history museums of, um, of birds. And the reason I brought in um, Asher Durandis, there's just this one little bird here, right? <laughs> there were probably a lot more, right? But Durand couldn't picture the birds because his, his mode of representing the woods involved sitting still and copying the things that sat still for him um, and creating an idea of a representation of the landscape that fit his worldview. But just because indigenous people didn't make three-dimensional illusionistic representations of the land, doesn't mean that they weren't representing this land and their intergenerational transhistorical representation, a relationship with it. So that's where I'm going to end. But I do note that in this little picture of this garden, on this land where we had so many introduced species, my sense of uh, Cole's wife, she sure loved her, a French rose or a Chinese uh, a hothouse flower. We see some echinacea. We see some other kinds of plants. Maybe the insistence of that original landscape created by Sky Woman forcing itself through the ground here. Thank you.